All right, and welcome back to Perks Pod Podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, if you're listening to this on Spreaker or YouTube, um, I am here with my good friend, one of my best friends, uh, a fellow man of the arts, the man behind the camera, Mr. Philip Wheeler. How are you doing tonight? Doing good. Just chilling. All right, that's what's up. So um, I am officially going to title this episode dream chasers because essentially that's what we are um for those of you who don't know me and philip's background uh just a quick backstory um i met philip i think it was my sophomore year in college uh we had both taken the public speaking class and um he always sat in front of me uh we never really spoke person to person and then one day we were tasked by our teacher to um make a speech about how to do something. And Philip, if I remember correctly, yours was um had to do with like digital art or like turning um drawn art into digital art. Well th- that was one of them. And we had other we had other ones, remember? Cuz I did one over films. I don't it might have been the digital art when you did yours on acting but i remember i did one of mine on film i think uh that's kind of where we both were like huh like we're both into the same thing yeah so um that day it was uh we were tasked with you know making a speech on how to do something uh some people did a speech on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich uh one dude did a speech on how to do a backflip <laughs> one dude uh did a speech on how to pass a basketball um and i did my speech on how to break down a script uh basically taught things about uh obstacles um tactics uh character um basically how to break down a script to figure out what your character needs wants um is willing to do uh to basically get to their objective and um after I made that speech, uh, Philip approached me after class and said, Hey, you act? And I was like, yeah, I, I dabble. I do a little here and there. Um, and he followed me all the way to my car. Now notice, I have to walk um, at least 400 yards to my car. And this little guy out of nowhere just followed me all the way to my car and was talking to me about... Um, film and stuff and uh mostly about him being behind the camera uh asking me more questions about myself and what I do um yeah and I guess long story short that's uh the rest is history you know we ended up linking some more times getting to know each other uh started working on some things and um what you got to say Philip well I was also talking about basketball remember that so I like we're not here about basketball. I know, I know, but that, it's part of the dream, okay? <laughs> so at first, the first dream for both of us was basketball. But then it slowly but surely turned into more film-related activities. Jelani's acting, mine was directing, or just filmmaking in general. But um, I remember that was something that I did, or I spoke about when I was talking to you. So that was like, it was like two things we were connecting on. There was like, we were able to talk about certain things we relate to as basketball and filming. This is true. This is true. So, um, but enough backstory because honestly, we have so much uh, history at this point that I could make a whole nother po- podcast about it. But um, really, I want to get down to, you know, want to hurry up and get down to the essence of what I want to make this Dream Chasers episode about. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions. I may already know. Um, a lot, if not all, of what I'm about to ask you, but some of our listeners may not know anything about it. Um, I want to ask you, Philip, uh, what was it that created the spark in you to get behind the camera? Well, the spark, I could say it was uh, many sparks. It was just uh, certain points in my life after my basketball dream had kind of died out. The sparks for that kind of just went out. And then a spark came when I was in graphic design class. That's when I started to, you know, experiment with photography and testing out editing software. And, uh, you know, an old friend of mine also had the same um, inspirations with film. He kind of helped spark that as well. And then we just took off from there. 
Okay. So um, with you getting behind the camera, um, did it start off like when you got behind the camera? Did it start off you wanting to learn how to film things or wanting to direct things? Or did it start as simple photography or simple videography and just develop into you wanting to do more, wanting to be more with the camera? Well, it's kind of weird how it started because it was like a string of things that kind of like brought me back to my childhood, which is it's very interesting how that works with people in general because as we grow into adults, a big strong part of who we are is attached to our childhood. And um, I kind of started to remember things the more and more I experimented with film or not film per se, but uh, just photography because that's what I did first. I was taking pictures with an iPhone 6 with my friend everywhere. We would just go everywhere and just take pictures and uh, just basically have like these deep conversations about what inspired us. And it kind of like made me subconsciously dive into my, my own history, my own past. And it made me remember that when I was a child, I used to love war films, specific war films like The Last Samurai and uh, we were soldiers in most of the Lord of the Rings movies, uh, specifically the war scenes when they would set up like um, brigades of soldiers in certain like in, in a in a bird's eye view they looked like squares, but it was like thousands of soldiers in squares and they were all like you know attacking like a fortress or or per se like we were soldiers a more more modern day militaristic uh, scenario where they would hide behind certain trees or like they'd they'd sneak up on the enemy or, you know, it it was just something that I was inspired by and I used to recreate those scenes with army men and I would I would get VHS tapes and I would set up my own fortresses and my own like fake vehicles or whatever and then uh, I would I would create my own remixes of what those battle scenes were and what I wish would have happened or I, or I was curious to see what what the battle scene would play out as but those those things right there kind of helped me kind of string together what and who I am today in terms of my motivation in terms of how I kind of sparked it on my own because you know everything we do we um obviously we need a spark but then after that spark is lifted it's up to us to keep the flame and that's basically what what I did I was just stringing together my past and just going from there so um really interesting uh mention that you that you talked about was uh going back to how the bulk of what we are as adults and just kind of the mentality or the 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 visions that we have stem back to what we had as you know as a child um i know with me as a child i always loved movies like i got movies as a gift and love those because I just love to watch movies. Now, I can honestly say myself as a kid when I watched those movies, I didn't have that initial thought of like me wanting to be an actor or wanting to be in such movies. I just just enjoyed them. I just enjoyed movies that really drew me into the story and really drew me into the world of whatever whatever I was watching. As a kid, you know, when you were setting up those army men, making your own forts, envisioning what would have happened uh, differently in whatever film that you were into at the time. Did you, in your mind, like, consciously say to yourself, this is what I look forward to do in the future? Or was it just something that you did um, that you just thought was fun or interesting and it just built into something else? Well, I guess you could say that's what we have in common because I wasn't thinking about making movies. I was just having fun. Just just like how you were, I was just having a good time, and um, I would rewatch those movies over and over and over again as a child. And I probably shouldn't have been because those are very bloody, gory films, and I was like a child. But I wasn't disturbed by it. I just found it very fascinating um, the way war kind of played out. It was just very. I don't know. I, I I can't say I can't admit that I was desensitized to death in film. Completely different than death in real life, of course, but but you know how you know how it is. Media has changed the game for society in terms of the way people think. But um, yeah, no, I was I was not thinking about becoming a director at all, not even a little bit. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that because um, I know for me personally, I loved watching dinosaur movies. Like Jurassic Park was my thing growing up, and the crazy thing is. 
there was so much that went on. I used to have nightmares about dinosaurs, like straight up nightmares, hiding under tables, uh, velociraptors coming in my home, and it used to scare the crap out of me, but I would still watch them. I couldn't stop watching them. Um, but uh, I do want to move on to um, a little further down the road. Um, going back to when me and you started first talking about creating film, um, one of the first things that me and Philip, actually the first thing that me and Philip officially did on camera together was a a uh, little 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 sentimental film called Aphrodite um on Philip's YouTube channel. I told y'all about that in a previous podcast, but um it was kind of a it was almost a um a shout out or less of a shout out but an actual um heart to heart video that went out to a specific someone. I'm not going to put that person or you on blast by saying who. Um but it was a uh, very interesting um very interesting video, very interesting concept. When we made that video, or around the time we started um, kind of brainstorming for what we were going to do for it, did you have anything in you um, that gave you a hint of all the work that we would be doing in the future, or um, anything that kind of uh, gave you an insight as to just our productivity as a team? Um. I'm not gonna lie. During that point in time, I, w- I was testing things out. I didn't know, I didn't know how to make a movie. I didn't. I watched and I I read books and watched YouTube videos or whatever. But I could. It's so much different than just tr- actually experiencing it. So I was just trying to fill it out. And you were there. You know, you were you were just you were there in those moments to like help me do those things. You know, you had your own things going on as well. So whenever I, I reached out to you, I was just hoping you'd be down. And you usually were. You were always down. And I didn't I didn't per se see us working together more. But because I, I didn't know what else to work on exactly. Because I was, I was so in the moment on that one project. And, you know, th- it was definitely... It was definitely nowhere near what we ended up doing right after. Because what we did right after Euphorica was so much better in terms of storytelling, in terms of uh, scene to scene in action playing out through through a day and showing the inside of a character's mind through action and through through s- just different visuals. All right, and perfect segue into that Euphorica, our first official short film. Um, that we ended up winning an award for at Make Em Feel Festival. Um, probably one of our proudest moments uh, individually and as a team. Um, and, of course, we both feel like we've been in been in or have produced much better work since then. However, um, there's something special to be, you know, said about the things that just kickstart things. Um, you know, s- s- things like um, one of Quentin Tarantino's first films, uh, Reservoir Dogs, how we can look back at it now um, not the greatest film, you know, especially not the greatest film that he's put out, but it's one of those things that kind of put him on the map or just really got him going. Um, I want to ask questions as to um, what were some of the expectations, if you had any, that you had going into making Euphorica, and um, were any of those expectations met, and what proved to be a lot more challenging than what you thought was going to be when you first started the project it's funny it's funny you asked that because we both had i remember we both had the same expectation which was we just learned about the festivals film festivals and we knew making film festival was a thing so the goal was just make it into the film festival making film festival and it was crazy for both of us i remember because we ended up not only making it into the film festival, but we ended up winning the Make and Made block, which was a gigantic achievement for us at where we were at that point in time. We became we we locally networked correctly. Like we got all the connections we needed within the area here, which is a huge step up and it was exactly what we needed to, you know, take the next step. So I I didn't expect all that to happen, but it happened the way it should have, for sure. All right, that was actually great insight to, you know, kind of the aftermath. Um, so I'll rephrase, in my mind, um, I guess I didn't word it 
perfectly, right? Um, when I meant expectations, uh, I meant like what it was like and the expectations of when you were making the film. Mm. Uh, when we got together, when we started working on script, building story, changing things around, and then when we got, you know, actually into the action when you got behind the camera and I got in front of it um the expectations in that whole process and then just what were the more difficult elements than you thought was going to be um you know some of the things that you thought w was not going to be as difficult as it actually was when it came down to filming it it's funny you asked that because uh I was just looking through my notes today I was looking through all my old notes on my phone in terms of just deleting them I had way too many and I saw old Euphorica notes. I saw old Aphrodite notes as well. And that was before Euphorica. But I seen Euphorica notes and I seen some of the bullet points I wrote. And half those things we didn't even go through with, which was pretty cool because we, you know, we improved and we ended up doing what we needed to do to make it come alive. But when we ended up filming, the only, f the only scene that really came through the way that I kind of envisioned it was the high scene, mm -hmm. which is crazy because that's the main scene that like hooked the whole audience, every audience that had seen the film. It's basically the only CGI type moment in the film, which, you know, CGI is the magic of film in general, and it's what it's a big part of what people like going to the movies to see. And it was crazy how that that's what worked. But everything else in terms of dialogue between you and Mark, it was based off of how you two felt on delivering those lines and on, you know, filling those lines out with each other. Y'all built a relationship within your characters, which is is honestly very, very impressive. And I, I, I kind of learned myself as a director in those moments. I, I felt the need to let y'all do it to let y'all make those decisions, um, change lines if you need to, you know, as long as the message is received, that's all that matters because half the time, it it really, I mean, to me personally, it doesn't matter if you change, like, like two words because it feels better for you to say it because if you end up saying something you're not comfortable with saying, it's going to come off awkward, you know, because it's in your head and it's shown in your action. So I, I kind of, I learned a lot just in in general on that film with just allowing things to change, allowing things to grow into something else. And I think that's a big part of, in directing that a lot of other filmmakers who are starting out, not all of them understand that. Some of my peers don't understand that, some of my friends, that you got to let your actors do what they need to do, what they feel that they need to do. And the thing about that is you have to cast correctly as well which is a whole nother thing. So you got to make sure that you have the right actors. I mean, it's common sense, but at the same time, it's not. It's a lot easier said than done because they're actors. You know, you, you are an actor. Um, it's so easy for someone to, like, be one way when you first meet them. And then, you know, the relationship changes. Um, depending on the actor and depending on the person in general, they'll say anything anything they can to get that role if they want that role they'll say whatever do whatever you know um so you really have to read people in in my seat you really have to know who you're talking to because like it's all about that connection it's all about who y'all are and uh, i'm learning right now from that i was watching some nolan videos like he had a whole conversation with uh matthew mcconaughey uh before they did Interstellar, they had a three-hour conversation. They didn't speak nothing about the film at all. And Nolan said later in an interview, he said he was just trying to see what kind of person he wasn't and how they could connect because that's more important because if you're working day-to-day, month-to-month on something so rigorous, it's, it's, not, it's not something that really can just happen just because, oh, you, you know the same thing as them about the film or whatever. It's all about chemistry. And perfect note to piggyback on. Um, let's move forward and talk about the next thing after Euphorica. The big thing that still isn't quite finished yet, but will be soon, Midnight. Um, 
godly the the film about over three years in the making basically it's one year spent writing and and tweaking and changing and two years spent filming and quite a few months spent in af- uh, post production um a long time spent in post production almost four years worked on this um I want to uh talk about uh when you were talking about casting connections uh the type of people that you'll be working with um you know talent isn't everything acting ability isn't everything it also really stems with the type of person that you're working with and um how well you guys can work together how well you can mold each other into what you need to be in order to produce um, the proper product and uh, to create the the closest to the perfect vision that you want for the project. Um, let's start off with the the what we were talking about just now. Um, the first thing, casting, because um, even I had to audition for Midnight, even though it was kind of a little, you know, already known, but I still had to audition for it. Um, me and you already had history at that point. Me and you already knew how we worked with each other, um, which, um, ladies and gentlemen, I have butted heads with Philip before. However, it has never been related to film. When it comes to me and Philip working together, when it comes to writing, creating, on set, um, you know, behind the camera, in front of the camera, I have never once butt heads with Philip. Um, and I think it's a beautiful thing because you don't see that a lot. Um, you know, I've been working side by side with Philip for just about four years now. And to say that I never butt heads with him on any level when it came to us creating is a beautiful thing. And honestly, I haven't even butt heads with you in general in a long time. Um, you know, I think we've both matured in our own ways as people and as professionals, and we've we've been moved past that. Um, but I am glad to have had those moments with you, um, and I feel like that also makes our bond stronger because we have seen where we were and where we've come to now. Um, but to get back to it, uh, the casting, what was the most challenging aspect of casting and what was the biggest thing you were looking for when you were, you know, seeing these auditions and um, paying attention to these people who were submitting to your film? Well, a lot, just like you, I knew what character you were going to play and I had an idea, a strong idea of what all the other actors, what characters they would play. There was like two switch rounds. Like there was, there wasn't even no actually, yeah, there was two, two or three big ones. That was uh, the main character was was um, auditioned by three different actors, mainly two, and then the third one was like the gem that we needed. Um, the first two were Eric Henderson and Connor Vinson, and they had a completely different approach to the character. One, and it was funny how it is. I, I I talked to both of them about this too. Um, Connor's approach to Kieran, the character, was not enough. It was not enough energy. It was not enough Kieran. Um, Kieran energy. Eric's approach, it was too much energy. It was it was way too much Kieran energy, I guess you could say. It was it was um it was just more and Connor's was less. And then I met Levi, which was uh Hannah's boyfriend who plays Star. She plays Star. He was right down the middle exactly what we needed and then there was also Alec which was one of the I guess you could say anti-hero of the story uh it was going to be Chris Payne Chris Payne was a very interesting guy his his acting is very typecast in terms of how I'm seeing it um and I I think that's how he he even explains himself in in acting I guess, but it was funny because I was thinking it could be Chris, and then I was speaking to uh, Walter Duckworth as playing Castle, and then, no, not Castle, was it? Yeah, it was Castle. Yeah, it it was weird how that was, because I met, and then I met another guy, Clint, Clint, um, 
Walker, Clinton Walker. And Clinton Walker, he played, he honestly had that castle look. I was like, okay, so he's definitely playing castle. But where is Walter going? Walter was like, at that point in time, we were like, he's like a handful of talent that we need to, we need to put him somewhere. And I can't, I can't just like side Walter out. You know, Chris, I I love Chris too, but it was, there was something about Walter in those moments. And he honestly had this thing, this emotional connection to his family that kind of like mirrored the character. So I ended up casting him as Alec. And I moved Chris Payne over to another character that we ended up using for a flashback that was a strong connection to Alec. And he played Leon. Chris Payne eventually played Leon. Way more sadistic of a character. Way more in the line of what Chris would just absolutely just go off on. No one has seen that scene with him. But when they do, they're going to be like, damn. Like, he, he, he only has one scene. But he really shows his 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 talent. Um, honestly, it's like when he gets that, when he sees it, he's gonna. I already know he's gonna love it. He's gonna really love that scene. But there was only in terms of casting, there was there was those things. It's such a adventure trying to find the right people for a role because it's like I said, you gotta really like like learn these people. But at the same time. You have to know the characters, and you got to really match up these people. And this is what I was saying the other day. It was, it was kind of funny. I was like, I was saying that um, the characters, the actors play are like avatars to those actors. They're, they're an avatar for those actors. I was trying to find the avatar for everybody. Like, who who's could play who, who could control who better, you know, in terms of the character. Because, like, you know, you put one person in the wrong role, if you put an actor in the wrong role, the whole entire orchestra of the film is just off beat. So, like, so crazy. And I've seen it in many local films. And I was, like, I was so, like, paranoid at one point. I did not want that to happen in my film. I did not want anything to be off beat in terms of acting because... I'm huge, when it comes to film, I'm huge on performance. Performance, obviously, is what carries a film, but it, like, that's what graphs me. I am a filmmaker. I like, I like seeing good CGI. I like seeing good effects. I like seeing good composition with the camera and everything. You know, I'm a photographer as well, but I really love to see an actor dive into a character. I love seeing actors work together and come up with ideas come up with solutions to getting the scene done, you know, working with me, working with the director and and everyone else on board and getting something done. It's like magic. It warms my heart. It's one of the few things in this world in term in terms of work that I can say that I'm like in love with. Yeah, it's um it's very interesting cuz um you know my friend Rich, um, Richard Kelly. Uh, he's a friend of mine who graduated from our college. He, you know, he's down in Florida. Um, he's also, um, you know, an up and coming director himself. And I had recently helped um, as an assistant casting director uh, for his new series that he's making. And when I say that I've finally gotten a taste of what it's like to see multiple people try out for multiple roles. And even come to a crossroads where it's like, it's it's sometimes it gets tough to figure things out, um, especially when you don't know the people. Because I didn't know a lick about anybody of who I watched. And at the end of the day, it's more so on you know Rich because this is his film. I was just helping with um, you know the casting uh, and giving him notes on what my impressions were from uh, from the auditions. One thing I did learn from that uh, that whole experience and something that I even saw from videos that I watched of other actors talking about auditions, um, and if any fellow actors are listening to this, it's actually very beneficial when you go into auditions to submit yourself doing the same thing with multiple different takes. 
in multiple different ways. And um, I can't remember who I was watching. Um, I think it was either Matt Damon or Don Cheadle, but they, they said that when they are submitting auditions and stuff like that, if you're doing a video submission, it's best to do multiple takes where you have just different approaches because if you just send in one, they're only seeing that one side of you and that one take on the character. But if you come with different takes, they can see the different levels of what you're able to do. And just in case, if one take is not the energy they were looking for, you can submit another one that might be closer, may possibly be farther, but might be closer to what you were expecting. But just in case you don't get that role, it does show that you have different levels. Um, there are there were people who submitted an audition where they did um, multiple roles. Um, some people auditioned for multiple roles. And the performances, even though the people were very different, felt very, like, static. It felt like the same performance, just with different lines. And then you had people that submitted multiple performances for the same role, and they did it one way, and then they did it another way. And I showed, oh, okay, so you do have other things that you have in your arsenal and that you can do. Um, and I just thought that was a very interesting take. Um, it's, it's funny you say static. Because static actors is a whole category. <laughs> I think static ad actors are the typecast actors. Those are the ones that, they're still good actors. You just have to find where they fit. Because those static actors, they do deliver lines so similarly with different characters. But sometimes those different characters fit that static. You know, there there's certain... There's certain character types to certain personalities, and that's what the static is. It's it's that they, they are that personality so strongly that it's very hard to jump around. You know, some actors, you know, like Heath Ledger, uh, you know, talk like really what they what they call them. Um, what's it called when they when they go like all out, like how um, Christian Bale um, went super skinny. There's a word method, method. Yeah. that so method acting that's that's like the opposite of static acting I, I guess you could say because um, they change their whole biology of their life or of their mm -hmm. body which is extremely like or not extremely but strongly like linked to their mental which you know also ex is expressed in their lines. Yeah, and that's why method acting, it's um, it's a double-edged sword for sure because um, it can actually have a legitimate effect on your mental um, or your physical, such as Heath Ledger. Um, you know, his method acting and just some of the personal life choices he made, you know, led to, of course, the tragic ending that most of us know happened to Heath Ledger. But um, uh, I do want to move on from casting to the actual filming of midnight so this was both yours and mine first feature film um this was the first one you filmed this is the first one i acted in um i can personally say that uh there are good days and there are bad days um personally with performance and then just in general as well um man the roller coaster of filming for two years uh just so many things can happen uh, so many people to to orchestrate and to you know to try to organize into what you need to get done um, was just a lot now uh, a lot of people don't understand that Philip was doing a lot for this film he was directing he was filming he was producing he was doing so much behind the scenes he was scheduling he was reaching out to people um he was working on budget like um he was basically doing it all the only thing he wasn't doing was acting um the only thing he didn't do for that film and um with directing with getting what you need to get for the day when you are behind that camera when you see what your actors are doing um whether it's blowing it out of the water or whether they're just it's just not clicking and you're just not getting what you need to um what is it that you do or what is the process you go through with you know you yourself and your inner thoughts and the process that you kind of 
um, you know, when you display that to the actors and what you need, what does that process look like when you try to get exactly what you need for the scene? Since I'm, I guess you could say I'm, I'm very new to this. I, I tend to call the actors prior a day prior or, or or however long before to talk about many things um everything about the character what they think about the character um really just what their experiences was before in acting i just try to get to, get to know that person all together and then when we get to filming it's almost as if a lot of the rehearsal part was was between me and the actor was done that part done already so the only rehearsal that really needs to be done is between the actors and i say that because um the director is you know in charge of you know expressing how they want that character to be perceived and i i go ahead and i get that done way before cuz while on set especially for that film just like you said i was doing i was doing a lot it was like method directing I don't know, um, but I, that right there, like, I, I knew there was so much to do. I said I just needed to go ahead, make that connection with the actors before so I could handle those other things with Jacob. Jacob uh, was handling audio and also handling a lot of the other behind-the-scenes things with me, and there was so much. There was so much that we had to just make sure it was right for the scene to look on camera because you know set make sure the locations are good the the people who own those locations you know some of them wanted money some of them were just cool with it but then sometimes those locations need a little tweaking we i, I remember the when the first scene we filmed i did mi i missed one thing and it was like this rainbow like chalk on on the wall behind walter's head i was like damn oh well I'm going to compromise on that. Like, like he's talking, and in the background, there's, like, this rainbow right over his head, and it looks like a hat. <laughs> but it's like it doesn't look like a hat, but it does in my eyes because I'm, like, because I'm always looking at symbolism, and I'm not really trying to symbolize that he's thinking rainbows and butterflies. <laughs> but so I hope that the audience doesn't, like, in the future when we're making bigger movies, they don't go back to that movie and be like, oh, he, he meant to do that. Because I didn't. But a lot of things in film are on purpose. And in this film, there were a lot of things, uh, subtle things that were on purpose. Um, but you have to catch them. And you'll, like, most people, most film critics will see it and know. It's going to be interesting when that movie comes out. Because it's been a long time. I was, that movie, or that filming process was eight months as well. Since you you mentioned filming. It was eight months it was eight months with everything. It was eight months writing. It was like maybe a month or two in between that and filming. And then it was eight months filming. And then like not even a month of break. I went straight into editing. It was uh, eight months of editing. Just about. Yeah. And it's still not done editing. My cousin is doing all the sound and music right now. So when that's finished, the movie will be completed. Yeah, and the uh, once again another great segue. Um, let's talk about post production, because a lot of people, when they see films, especially if they're not in the industry themselves, uh, they don't really put much thought into what goes on, uh, not only before but after filming. Um, so with the whole process of post production. Um, the scoring, uh, working on the music, uh, editing, um, you know, putting the, the, the pieces of the puzzle together uh, to create what Midnight will eventually look like in the near future. Um, can you tell us a little bit about just the amount of work that had to be done um, just outside of what you see on the camera and just... Um, how much, how important that process is to properly putting together a film. So, so you're asking me all the just the importance of all the running parts, basically. Um, 
So going into editing, a lot of the scenes, you know, you know, you have like a lot of footage just in one scene. Like one scene, we took five days to film one scene that was like eight to ten minutes, but it took five days, four to five hours each day filming and some of the stuff like one scene the one scene that did take five five days or well, one day we filmed in one room it's all in one house we filmed in one room and then we filmed a little bit in the living room with mm-hmm. and with certain actors and then the next day different actors same living room um different people same moment and then we filmed another scene that was outside with other characters and then we had we had them you know be outside then come inside or whatever one of the actors uh Dustin's character he came inside and then some of the actors from the other day were in there so all that basically is a lot of planning a lot of more than the script more than the um storyboard more than the shot list it's keeping up with everything making sure that it all connects because you write the script, you write the storyboard, you write the shot list, but then you have to divide that shot list within what's capable, within the means of what you have, with the resources you have, with the time you have. The actors have lives. You know, they have other things they're doing. Everyone has something else they're doing. So getting their time to do such a task at such a consistent level is probably the hardest thing that I had to deal with in making the movie. And that, a big part of that, I'll admit, is the relationship that I had to build with each and every individual. Um, In those moments of the film, everybody was my best friend. (laughs) Everybody was gang. You know, everybody was like, like, bro, that's sis, that's bro. Like, everyone is like super close. I know what's going on. I know they're, they're, whatever they got going on as far as they tell me, you know. Um, and if they didn't, I digged. You know, I wanted to know what was going on, if there was anything going on. Um, whoever I didn't know everything about was already okay with just being there, which is perfect because I don't want to know everyone's business. You know, I just need to know what's going on. That's it. And a lot of those a lot of those people, they did a big thing. And none of them, no one got paid. None of the actors got paid. It's a crazy thing to say that. I'm not getting paid. No one was getting paid at all. And they showed up. Like, regardless of whatever happens after this movie in terms of relationship, I'm, like, in gratitude for every single person that was a part of this film because they put in work for free. Because I had a vision, and they believed in my vision. Whether it be... Whether it be an actor or whether it be someone behind the scenes. You know, and a big part of that is they have a vision. Um, and that's what I do. I, I talk to these people, and I I try to see what their vision is of the project. What do you think? What do you see? And that's what kind of carries over, I, f- I feel like. Everything carries over based on what, what, do, what are we coming together to create. And that being the case... It actually ended up happening, and I, I, I think everything happens for a reason. That's just what I believe personally. I, I believe everything happens for a reason because if it didn't, um, the movie wouldn't even be done. Or, or it's not done, but it wouldn't even have gotten this far at all. So I'm still going to always say this. You always stay tuned because, honestly, it got this far. It's going to come out. I don't care what happens. I'm making sure that movie comes out. Yeah, and this um it was definitely a lot that went down uh in the middle of filming. Um just so much that happened and you know, it's it, I mean, of course at the end of the day in in the professional world, you know, it would be a job, it would be a career and you know, just like you said with knowing what's going on with people. Um you know, usually if you're getting paid and this is an actual job, you don't bring your outside stuff to work. Um but uh, me and Philip have seen firsthand that um, when it comes down to this independent work and, you know, people 
giving us, you know, their time for nothing in exchange but to see this project happen. Um, it's kind of hard to keep outside stuff from coming in, and sometimes that can definitely affect not only performances but just chemistry on set and just um, in the whole the project as a whole. Uh, so, you know, that is really commendable, you know, knowing what's going on with people and actually caring enough to, to ask and to, to, to see what is going through people's heads. Because at the end of the day, uh, especially since we're not getting paid for it, we, we really don't have that filter to say, Hey, I'm, I'm on a job. I'm getting paid. Let's just put this away for now. Cause we've seen that it doesn't always happen like that. Um, shoot, even if you were to get paid on a job, if you have a lot going on personally, sometimes things bleed through a little bit. Um, and like I said, we, we've personally seen that, and I think that you did uh, a very good job, uh, no, a great job of holding things together when those things happen. <laughs> um, I would like to uh, kind of highlight on something that me and you have personally talked about before. When you're going through this process and you're, you know, these past two and a half, almost three years of working on this thing, both me and you are at the same point where we're just like, we're done working on it, want to be done working on it, ready for it to just be done so we can move on to the next thing. Um, I can attest to this. There was a lot of stressful things that went on throughout filming, um, not just film itself, but just in our personal lives. Um, but filming, yes, um, it's not always sunshine and rainbows above Walter's head. Um, it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of dedication. It's a lot of perseverance. Um, we talked earlier about sparks, about having the spark to do what we want to do and do what we love to do. And there was at a point where we had a heart to heart conversation where it was almost like, you know, we didn't want to do this at one point. All right, there's a spider. I'm about to freak out. I'm going to go ahead and kill it before. Yeah. I've never seen a spider in here. Ah! Oh, it went faster. Oh, it's coming. Oh, okay, I'll pick them up later. All right. Um, thank you for that uh, commercial break. We're back. Um, the spider is officially dead. Um, continuing. We talked about sparks. Um, you know, we went through a lot during filming. Uh, a lot of things happened. We had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation about how some of the things that we went through almost made us feel like we just didn't want to do it. Not anymore, like, for good, but we just wanted to take a pause and take a break and just be like, nah. And then, shortly after we finished, there were things that reignited the spark, both for you and for me. Um, different things for you, different things for me. You know, I had my own things that reignited my spark of acting, and you had different things that reignited your spark of creating, writing, and directing. Um, I want you to talk about how it felt to kind of lose that um, that high-spirited drive. You didn't lose the drive completely, but lose that high-spirited drive, and what it was that brought you back to that that initial, like, I love to do this moment, and just that feeling in general. I really just needed a good R and R, rest and relaxation. I needed that really bad. Um, when we got done filming, I had I had never had a acne breakout that bad, and the whole time I was thinking it was food, but then I realized it was stress because as soon as that filming process was done, all that pressure was off my back, all my acne disappeared, clearest face I've ever had, from from worst. To, to best in within a month or two. And I was like, wow, that's what mental health can do to your body. Um, I just needed a rest. And what I did for the, pa for the next, shoot, it's been a year now because we got done filming last year around this time. Mm -hmm. um, what I did... As of recently, as well, I, I just watched a lot of movies. Um, I read a lot of books. I, I watched a couple videos. I didn't watch too many videos this time around. Before we started making our movies at first, I was watching a lot of videos, like YouTube videos on all kinds of things. But this time around, I kind of just stuck within... I stuck within just watching film, paying attention to those little things. 
watching like full on series, what makes those series good? You know, like Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Marvel, all the Marvel movies. That's that's still I'm almost done. I'm almost caught up in terms of movies. There's also shows that I'm I'm going to watch too. Um but I just I just went into watching everything, all everything. Fast Furious, all the good ones, even like old films. And in the books I was reading too, I was just reading different narratives. And I also dove into a, a book called Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. And I just started putting a microscope under uh, or over that guy. I was watching how how he kind of goes about his way of thinking and and how he kind of continues his drive and and his dreams and kind of translate that into what I do because what he does is in our field. And he is really good at you know explaining things. I I can't lie. He he is a big part of me getting that that vigor back because I was able to to just listen to what he was saying and and just, you know, kind of just get inspired. Like, I opened myself up to get inspired. And a big part of that was to really get away from film in general, to kind of just focus in on everything else that I was not focusing on while filming. I was able to finally just kind of balance all those other things, uh, mainly financially. Um, That's always going to be a thing, you know, for everybody, obviously, but... But I, I just had to just finish school so I could start working. That that was just the main thing. Like, I, just like I said, we weren't getting paid. We were spending money to make that movie, and I was not working a like a good paying job while going to school. So I was just broke all the time, like always. I'm used to being broke, but it was like. We're getting older. It's time to make that money. It's time to get on our feet, live on our own, and, you know, build our own kingdom. Like, it's it's time for that. So I was finally able to at least get in some form of comfort zone in terms of being able to sit down and not worry about money because it then, it, it eventually hit a point where I was like, I need I need to get this financial thing situated. ASAP um but just like everything I always I always try to tell people this not everyone wants to listen to this perspective but you you can't you can't wait till you're 100% ready for anything to start it Mm -hmm. because it's never it's not always it's hard to say it's not always going to be the perfect time to do something you just sometimes you just got to do it you just got to do it and then go from there and that's what tells you everything. So I just I'm I'm still in the process right now in in writing again before I finish the movie. Before Midnight's done, I will have a whole another documentary that's going to be be out probably before Midnight. I, I'm not sure just yet, but the documentary is definitely a way smoother process and way more I guess you could say a non-fiction structured because that's what it is. That's the genre, in a sense. It's nonfiction, but it's a lot of it. It does boil down to, you know, what what I spend my time on, on the side, and in terms of away from film. That's honestly huge, because it's all paralleled. Your those things, those big parts of your life, family, uh, finances, everything. Man, uh, I had to do that too. I I had to drive my grandfather from Arizona to Fort Valley, Georgia, and or Mesa, Arizona to Fort Valley, Georgia. Huge drive, big big family moment for me. Uh, you know, we all have it, our own perspectives in our in our minds, and it was a big big growth experience for me, um, mentally and spiritually for myself. So I had to undergo those things. To, in order to get back into those high spirits, as you say, to start writing again, to start to want to create something bigger and larger than just a just a simple quick look, you know, because that's what films are. You know, you have to sit there and watch it. You you have to take time out of your day to get the picture, and that being the case, those ideas take a lot of energy, a lot of time, and and a lot of motivation 
and a lot of inspiration. You have to be in a certain mindset to do that, to do those things. And that was another thing that me and Jacob would talk about prior or during filming Midnight was being in certain mindsets to do certain things. You know, sometimes we we, we would even say uh, we want to write a scene, but we're so used to filming that we were just not in the mind state to write a scene mm -hmm. at all. But I, w I myself would force myself. And I think that's a big part of what kind of construed my mental in that time period. But... But yeah, just in general, man, it's you gotta you gotta align everything else at least a little bit. Nothing's gonna be one hundred percent ready or one hundred percent perfect to to do the next thing. You just gotta at least do your best, get things in order in some form of fashion, at least a little bit. Well said, well said. Um, we've talked about the past. We've talked about the present. Um, I think it would be a great note to end this episode um, with just visions for the future. Um, this whole process that you've gone through um, since me and you first got together and did the thing, um, the things you've learned in this journey so far, the things that you've um, improved upon, the things that you've realized that you were lacking, um, the things that you still need to improve – um, what can you say about yourself that you know can help you prepare for what's to come? What about you that you know that you have within yourself that can make you say, I can tackle that when I, when I get there? Um, you know, we're, we're talking about big leagues, you know, we're talking about when we get older that we're going to do this. We we just read a book series that eventually we want to make into something, in, into reality, do it right. Um, the I Am Number 4 series, we read that. Philip got me hooked on it. Um, couldn't stop reading, finished the series. Uh, they made the movie on it. Uh, absolutely trash. I have to watch it again just to remember how trash it was. Um, and, you know, we're... That's our one of the visions that newer visions that we have is to make that become something that people can watch and actually be proud of, especially people that have read the books. Um, but, you know, we have big plans ahead. We have big visions for ourselves. Um, so to sum up the question, what is it about you that you know it's going to be all right? Or you know you're gonna be able to basically do the damn thing um, when push comes to shove. Honestly, it's funny you ask that. I, I say that a lot because you always ask the right questions at the right time within this podcast, at least. Um, I've been thinking about that a lot uh, as the past couple of days, and the answer I boil down to is really just I just need a right. That's the answer. I just need to start writing, whether it be just a, a random monologue or just random ideas for a character. I just need to put pen to pad. That is literally the next step. That that is the step to get these to get these things done. Because if we were to make those those books into films, it must be adapted into a screenplay. Um. You know, and and I'm reading I'm reading these books too. Like I'm reading uh, the Screenwriter's Bible. It was something that my old my professor in college had given me to read, and it was years ago when she gave me that, and I I've yet to been able to read it. So now I'm finally reading it, and I'm I'll I'll most likely um you know refer to that as information to you know kind of help guide me writing these next couple of scripts and learning how to adapt a book into a script because you know books or more on inside thoughts of the characters versus screenplays are primarily revolved around action and dialogue. Mainly action, even more than dialogue. Um, but it's, it's just, I, it's really writing. Everything boils down to writing, to planning, to coming up with those magical ideas. Coming up with those ideas, those magical ideas are the ideas that get you going. If we can come up with the ideas that really get us going, that's just sparking ourselves. That's keeping the flame alive. It, and 
the only way to, you know, create those sparks to keep those flame alive is, you know, to keep writing. Mm-hmm. You know, is that that's literally the cure to this to this um dream or the cure to have the dream come alive. We'll see we'll see what happens in the next couple months in regards to that because I went ahead and already made those initiations of writing. I went ahead and got like a specific journal for my ideas. Um, for the stories, I, I went ahead and started writing more in my journal. I started getting um, more self-help, mental health books. You know, uh, the Green Lights Journal, um, and a bunch of different things. I already lined up other books I want to read after this one. I went ahead and read the I Am Number Four series to you know not only uh, get an inspiration, but to go ahead and and get that done because I've had those books for a while and I just I never read them I knew I wanted to read them and when I finally read them I felt as if a weight was also lifted off of my my back because I kept putting it off for so so many years so it, that's why I, I thought it was interesting that you got hooked on the books as well um, it kind of little things like that kind of proved to me that things are possible in terms of making something a reality in, in that sense of adapting that to a film and making it better than the one they released because you're right, it was trash. And they knew it was trash. That's why they didn't continue making those movies. Um, but it's just like, you know, just little things like that make me understand that it's not only me that think these ideas are remarkable, that these scenes, that these these, these written word, because... Obviously, if you're hooked, you liked the story that it was telling. You liked the events that occurred. And it's funny, a lot of those events that occur that you text me about, you'd be like, I can't believe this happened. I can't believe uh, the character did this or whatever. Those are the same thoughts I had when I was reading. So it was like, it makes me understand that those things should be things that the audience can react to, that the audience can connect to that they can, you know, learn to enjoy when watching these films. And it just kind of proves to me that more, or it proves more to me that they should be made into films. And I don't see no one else talking about it. I don't see no one else trying to do it. So why not us? You know, why not? Why can't we be the ones to do it? And it's so funny saying that because in a sense we are, we are at step uno, even after the accomplishments we have made so far, mm-hmm. we're still at the very beginning of the adventure. And in doing, in, in understanding that, we're going to have to do things that are, you know, in, in a sense, risky. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we spend eight months or however long it takes to adapt a script or to write a script. Risking, as in, it might not even ever be made into a film, it might not ever see the light of day that sh- we have to be fine with that we have to be okay with those those risks like we have to be fine with those things because if we're not we won't continue writing but i say in order to be fine with those things you have to learn you have to you know just like a learn from your mistake thing um not saying that those will be mistakes but we're still learning in the process we adapt a whole script that's crazy you know, that's insane. We just wrote a whole script based on a book. Even if it doesn't see anything, it's still something that we practiced on yes. big time. It's like shooting a mid-range shot for, like, months, and, like, you just missed it during the game. doesn't mean you can't hit mid-range shots. It just means you just didn't hit it at that certain point in time. You'll have another time to hit that shot another game. That's a great analogy, yeah. So... There will, there's always opportunity. Just because it doesn't work one time, doesn't mean there won't be another opportunity in the future. That was really great analogy. I couldn't couldn't have said it better myself. Um, we've done uh, we've done a lot of self reflecting. We've done a lot of um, just you know digging and uh, telling the people of you know just the trials and everything that we've been through um, as a send off. Um, one of the biggest things that I've learned we have to to grow within ourselves in order to make it in this business is confidence. 
we have to learn and know the difference between cockiness and confidence. Um, you know, I can say without a doubt, um, and this is not a bragging statement or anything, um, both me and Philip himself are not cocky people at all. Um, if anything, we're continuously our worst critics, you know, uh, our biggest critics. Um, I know I am for myself, and I've seen you watch your own work, and, you know, I can see that thinking in you. Um, and one of the things that you need to succeed is some sort of confidence. So let's get confident. Um, I want you to tell something to the listeners that prove you've got what it takes to make it in this business. Okay. Well, I don't know anyone else that just nonstop thinks about film, that talks about film, that I, besides myself, I don't know anyone else that just comes out of nowhere and says, I could see that in a movie. I could see that. I could see that translated or randomly just speak up in a random scenario and just be like, honestly, that could be a great thing for a character or, or, or whatever, you know, in regards to a story. I don't know anyone else like me that does that in, in public, in public with other people. And a lot of times, I mean, of course, like they're not the same as me. And sometimes they're not even in the same industry, but even the people I've met in the same industry, I don't know anyone else like me in, in that regard that, that really just tries to connect every fucking dot possible, you know, because that's where I source my inspiration. I source my inspiration on everyday things, things that someone says like, or something that I see in, in an occurrence. I just, I don't know anyone else like that. I, I really do base a lot of my inspiration on literally everything. I'm basing inspiration right now on this. It's it's just, it's just, I, if, if I meet someone like that, sh- they're part of the team too, you know. And, I mean, I, I think I have, I've met borderline some people like that. But it's only if I bring up the topic. I'm always the one to bring up that topic and until I see someone else like that then I feel like I'm the only one that does it you know um but not to change the subject too much since I know this is one of the last things I might say there was another thing that I, I do want to mention that McConaughey did say that kind of it's something you said that made me want to want to put this out there for the listeners it was it was it was very interesting it was recently he posted a video he says he says he says, I don't really think that that we deserve anything. That's just wrong wording. It's it's do you earn it? Do you earn what you you think you deserve? Deserving is is I guess you could say bad wording. You know, you can always use better wording. Um, earning something is what the goal is. You know, if if you think in that way, if you think I need to earn it then you don't think that you deserve it in a sense. Like, when you deserve it, you don't work for it. When you earn it, you work for it. You see what I'm saying? There are no handouts, especially in what we do. We have to put in that work. We have to put pen to pad. You have to record your auditions. You have to send them in. You have to just read scripts. You have to network, look, and talk to people. And and shoot, you need to watch films. You need to study, like, constantly you know, as much as possible, you know, you have to get up and work for the money that, that you're, you want, you know, you have to earn it, um, this is for the listeners, like, it's, it just use the word earn instead of deserve, because once you see like that, then things come more naturally, because you're already walking those steps, instead of sitting there and waiting for it to come to you, that's what deserve is, walking and going towards it that's earning so i just want to put that out there well said i definitely agreed with matthew mcconaughey on that um you know that whole deserving thing there were people who posted comments about you know um you know they work this job so they shouldn't have to you know they deserve to live better off of um the wage that they're getting uh which 
I see what they're saying, um, but like I told you, I feel like it should be adapted to I've earned the right not to live this way because of what I'm doing, because of the job I'm working. And I just think that is a mentality that a lot of us need to get into. Um, and then I guess I'll send myself off with, uh, you know, my own little vote of confidence. Um, I am in the mindset where I am constantly studying, um, even when I don't want to. I've done a lot of research when it came to acting. Um, what like what comes with the industry, what comes with the territory, what you have to do to be an actor, what you have to do to work hard at it. And other than auditioning, which I don't think I've ever, ever met an actor, watched a video on an actor that enjoyed auditioning. Other than auditioning, I can honestly say that even the most grueling or tedious processes of being an actor I actually kind of enjoy um you know the research the the watching videos doing uh doing whatever homework you have to do when it comes to acting and one thing I've noticed is that just like I said I've I found myself studying acting when I had no plans to I have been drunk before I have had a night where I said I'm gonna get a couple of drinks in. I'm going to relax. I'm just going to chill and I'm just going to enjoy my night. When I tell you that same night, I ended up watching, I don't know what it was. I ended up watching a show and I would watch a scene. I would rewind the scene and then I would act in my room alone at freaking two o'clock in the morning along with the scene and do my rendition of how I would do it and just break down everything that's happening. Break down if I really believe this character and really look into the film itself and start to do basically just my performance just in my room. Um, I've talked with a lot of actors and even though I've never really told this to someone personally, um, just like you said with the things you've seen from other people in the industry that you talk to, I've never heard of people who just you know out of nowhere just start doing that stuff um especially in that mindset um you know I've had friends who say every time like I watch a film sit down and watch a film in the theater I start breaking it down or what whatever and I kind of do that unconsciously due to you know going to theater school um in high school and everything but um you know to be drunk at two in the morning when you should just be enjoying just not really caring about what's happening and then you end up like diving deeper than you do when you're sober into a film and really breaking it down and the fact that I find so much joy in doing it um I think that the biggest thing that'll carry me into the future is my love and my drive for not only acting itself but for getting better and improving um I feel like I do need to work on my confidence in my performance while I'm performing and watching myself perform. But when it comes to that love for the craft and just that hunger to do it, I don't know. It doesn't go away no matter what happens. Not to step on your, your send off, but, but I kind of feel like the send off should be uh, me saying how I see you as a, as a dream chaser. So, one thing about Jelani Perkins that I noticed is, and this is why I tell everybody, I tell everyone this, when they ask anything about Jelani, I say, they're like, well, what, what does Jelani do? What, what is he? What is he? I'm like, Jelani is an actor from the heart. He, I mean, he's many things, but an actor is one of those. And the reason I say that is, if I ever come up with an idea like hey if I have something solid it has to be solid if I present that solid idea to Jelani he is almost always extremely eager to tackle whatever that idea is and I found I found that interesting but it also proves to me that he's about it he loves what he does he loves acting he loves the whole idea, every single thing about it. Just like he said, he was drunk doing it. That right there is just another example of what makes him a dream chaser. 
with acting. It's 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 funny how it is because we did a, we did that reenactment, and I obviously I'm not an actor, but I wanted you know test it out. You were super eager to do that character, and it was just in reenactment, and just like you said, you said you're you're eager to do auditions as well. I mean, no one's eager to do auditions, but just the like the studying and research process that each actor has to go through for the role. Okay, okay. So the, the, the tedious homework behind the role. It's 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 all it's all part of it. I, I feel like it's it's crazy. Crazy as it says, like you're like I I would always say Jelani is the actor version of my director. Of what 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 I am as a director. He's the actor version of it. He is always trying to get better whether it be studying a film whether it be watching another actor whether it be practicing on his own reenacting i just i just know and whoever asks me anything i will always answer the same thing that this guy is an actor to the heart to the core of his person what well, damn philip over here tugging at my heartstrings but um Man, uh, I'm not gonna lie. This is a, this has actually been a very productive conversation. You know, I initially did this podcast to just get viewers a little insight on the things that we do, the things that we envision, and just our mindsets when it comes to our way up in this industry. Um, one last thing, I just want to mention when uh, you said that we're really at step one, and a lot of people that are especially not not in the industry that see us from the outside see the things that we post um some people don't really understand that we really are just at step one it's a long step one um you know from where we started we're definitely at a completely different place with different opportunities and different uh weapons at our disposal however this is still the very beginning stage you know i told you that when i posted um that poster for intimate confessions on my social media, I got into work and everybody was calling me movie star. Uh, I don't feel that, at least not yet. I mean, when we go on the red carpet stuff, um, I might start feeling that a little bit. But, um, you know, I don't feel that yet. And um, I just know that I have a lot more work to be done before I can honestly, in my heart, accept the title of movie star. There's so much. Um, I feel like I'm not even close. But, um, you know... I guess that may be the humble part of me or whatever it is, but we know that we have a lot of work to be done. But we also know that whatever work needs to be done, we're ready for it. Um, and even, just like you said, even if we're not absolutely ready for it, uh, best believe that we're going to do our best. Um, and, you know, that's that's just what it is and what it boils down to. And not only has this been an interesting listen for you guys, this has been an insightful conversation for me um, and just it always kind of refreshes going back on what we've been through and what we've gone through. We've talked about the past before, but this is probably the longest conversation about just pure, you know, industry and 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 acting and directing talk that we've done um, in just a little minute. It hasn't been too long, but still uh, definitely great insight. But. I thank you guys, the listeners, uh, for watching um, slash listening. Um, I appreciate Philip for giving me an hour and 20 minutes of his time um, to sit down and talk with me. Uh, this has been long overdue, but I'm glad we finally got to do this. Um, and just, I love you, man. It's It's been a journey, and I definitely look forward to all the stuff that we got in the works and the stuff that we will eventually have in the works and definitely look forward to see both of us grow into the men that I know that, you know, we're going to be one day. Yeah. Appreciate you having me, man. Love you too. We are the next generation. That's all I got to say. You heard it here. Uh, first folks, uh, we are the next generation of superstars. Thank you for listening to perks pod podcast. We are out.